You're listening to Sound Opinions. I'm Greg Cott with Jim DeRigatis. We're here at the Goose Island Barrel House. We have Wire with us, Colin Newman, Graham Lewis, Robert Gray, and Matthew Sims, the new member of the band. Welcome to Wire. Um, Thank you very much. Guys, Hello. it's great to have you here. All right, so I, uh, I'm going to start this, fellas. Uh, we've done this before. But I'm going to start. I'm going to talk to the most interesting member of Wire first. I want to talk to Matt. <laughs> I want to know, Matt, what it's like to get a call from these guys. I guess it's 10 years ago now? 2000? It was five years ago. Five years 2010. ago. 2010. All right, so, uh, you know, I, I know them well. Uh, I know that they're really teddy bears, but they can be somewhat intimidating to the new initiate. You get this call. How, how does the call come to join this band that at that point has 35 years of history? Um, well, I got the call to join. I was in the supermarket, and that would, this is the day after, uh, the, the evening after um, my first time playing with them. Um, but, yeah. As, you, as, I, as I said, I'm not much of a talker, so you're going to have to dig really hard. That's, that's <laughs> I'm sure you'll lie. say more than Robert, though. Mm -hmm. No, come on. I don't, I, what, were you a fan? Of course. How did you become, because what, you're 25 now, is that right? Uh, no, I'm, I'm uh, 29. Okay. How did you become acquainted <laughs> with Wire? There are so many You should hire points. a new researcher. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got all, all, the, all the numbers the wrong way around. I'm just another one of those journalists who has no clue who you guys are. Yeah. I'm one step above Suzanne Summers, right? You know what happened to her. <laughs> I know. I, she's still recovering from what Bruce Gilbert did to her on live TV. Um, what point did you become a Wire fan? What, what entry point? Um, it was actually when the first three records were reissued and I read um, a feature in Mojo magazine. Yeah. And stepping in, I think... Matthew, you're the first uh, member of Wire uh, it, that it was not a founding member of Wire. That, that's right. got to be a little bit of an intimidating situation to step into that role. Mm. Um, how did you sort of, uh, you know, incorporate the band's history into what you're doing as a player, if at all, you know, I, I, bringing it I, forward? I'm very much about now and the future, so I don't think intimidation is kind of, it's not really what I'm thinking about, to be honest. <laughs> So the history didn't in, in, intimidate you in terms of what you well, thought no, I'm a, to I'm bring. I'm a fan, and, and um, um, but I'm a fan of making stuff that's good and making it now. So that's kind of what I'm about. Well, that is the most inspiring thing to me about Wire is it is always about be here now. What are we creating now? What are we about to do in half an hour to terrorize these people <laughs> in, with our, our musical instruments? Um, but, you know, I've spent my entire professional career, fellas, uh, trying to tell the story of Wire to the world. So we have to go into a little bit of history. It's going to be four decades soon, since fall of 76, when you came together. Well, we, we count the 1st of April 77 as the, as the official founding date of the band. Because uh, that was the first gig that the, the, the sort of classic four-piece performed. It was after... We, we were originally a five-piece... I mean, the sort of shortest way to describe it is we were somebody else's band and we kicked out the f founder of that band. Poor George Gill. <coughs> yeah, poor George Gill. Um, and uh, that's weird. My voice is kind of... It's, uh, it's, very, it's very, very disconcerting. Um, yeah, it was... It, it, it was it was, that was the first, first of April, of course, April Fool's Day, um, <laughs> 1977. And, of course, the anniversary of that will be the first of April and Angela Conway's birthday as well, yeah. wasn't it? Is it? Yeah, yeah, it's Angela's yeah. birthday. All yeah, right. Whose birthday, Graham? Angela Conway. Oh. AC Maria's. Ah, there you go. And Bruce's ex. Yes, yes. At that point, uh, cheeky young art punks that you were, did you ever think you'd still be going in 2015? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> That's, I thought, oh, I shall retire as a member of WIRE. <laughs> no. You know what I mean? We were just like living from day to day. We were trying to get a gig. You know what I mean? Like everybody else when you start. But there was a strange... Because, because Wire is founded on an act of patricide. Um, <clears throat> so we, we, we already were going against what existed before. 
and that was uh, um, that's kind of set a template for the band. And so we we kind of we had to write a set really fast. That was the whole point because not only were we getting rid of a, a of the of the guy whose band it was, he'd written most of the material. So, you know, we had to write some, some stuff pretty fast. So the idea of writing things fast to a deadline, because we had a gig coming up, was already implanted in the band very early on. And so that, <clears throat> that 70s period where we kind of accelerated quite fast was kind of, it was just entirely natural. And, and I think, to be honest, if you'd have, uh, maybe not on day one of founding the band, but probably like after recording Pink Flag, if you'd have said, well, you're still going to be doing this in a few years' time. I don't think anyone would have said no. I think we, would have, we, we, I think we already thought, well, hang on, we can make this work. We're going, you know, we already had ma you know, material for what turned out to be Chairs Missing when, when we were recording Pink Flag. So it's, it was, you know, the, the, the <clears throat> it was just a logical sort of progression. Yeah, because it sort of ended up with... I don't know, I suppose the philosophy was, you know, they say you shouldn't kill your darlings, but we did, you know what I mean? And that was the only way that we could work. Um, can I tell an anecdote? I was, we were flying from uh, San Francisco to LA just a couple of weeks back, and who should be on the plane but Faye Waybill from the Tubes? And that was the first real tour that we ever did, you know? We never played in front of more than about 100 people before, and there we were playing city halls and they were in the papers for being outrageous and all of these Theatrical things. rock. Theatrical rock. Anyway, um, there was a bit of time at the, at the baggage carousel for the baggage coming through so I was able to talk to him and I said, I really have got to thank you for treating us so well because they could have crushed us. And they were so nice to us and I think, you know what I mean, all of those things kind of go together with the attitude we had, and you had people who were encouraging you and appreciating what you did, you know? Unlike Roxy Music. Well, Brian's got his thing to do, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Infamous tour opening for Roxy, uh, not treated very well. So those first It was the crew who didn't treat us well. The crew, yes. Yeah. Did you even get to be in the presence of the musicians? Oh, absolutely. Of course. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. I had a pint with Paul a few times. Okay. It's fucking I read late, you know. Yeah, but when 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 we played in Paris, and he, Brian complimented me on my, my attire. Yes. That I looked well cold. Ah. <laughs> we looked absolutely super. We wore white. Yeah. That's bragging rights being yeah. complimented on your dress by, by Brian Mr. Ferry. Ferry. Well, you know what I mean. I do know Anthony who does yeah. suit him up. I'd know. like you guys to talk about this a little bit too, because I think you always get characterized as you, you came up in the punk here, and some people have associated you with punk. But I, I thought from the start, uh, it was almost like we're, we exist in this era, but we're also not a part of it. It, it seemed like there was a very distinct uh, effort on your part. Uh, to separate yourselves even from the bands that you were associated with, you yeah, know, in terms well, of age and, and well, things Well, they were like all that. 76 bands, you know what I mean? And there was, it, it didn't appear to be any point of uh, copying what somebody else was doing. That's a ridiculous waste of time. Um, and I think, you know, with regards to sort of like that, you know, the art school background, you know what I mean? You'd heard about, learnt about Dadaism and these things, you know what I mean? This the kind of thing that gives you backbone, you know? I mean, we have, in, in a way, more in common with the, the, that American sort of New York set of bands. Um, British punk, and if you want to be totally brutal to British punk, you can reduce it to two singles, <laughs> I, I, I would say. Um, it, it, didn't, it doesn't have a very long shelf life. Which are? Uh, yeah, what are the two yeah. singles, Colin? I would say, I would say, Anarchy in the UK and um, New Rose by The Damned. Um, uh, Spiral Scratch is not a punk record. No, Spiral Scratch. You know, the, yeah. So uh, you know that, that's, and, and, and really, to be honest, that was all that was all kicking off in '76, as Graham said. But we, we're we're really a '77 band, and it was it was already uh, it was already embarrassing the number of sort of punk clone, you know, sort of Junior Johnny Rottens that there were out yeah. there. Just it, like it was, another bunch of people doing rock and roll, and, and they actually hated us. Way. Yeah. 
They hate they, uh, the the punks actually hated us. I mean, the, 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 from a British perspective, a gen, you know, you're talking about place and generation. So for people of our generation from Britain, there was no way we were a punk band. We were too weird. We were too, too our songs were too short, you know, and or too slow. And we were just, you know, we were saying all the wrong things, you know. Mm. It was, you know, and we and we looked too smart. Yeah, yeah that was the, that was the thing because punk seemed to uh, celebrate messiness, um, you know, getting drunk and falling over and all of that kind of stuff, which you can do at any time. But um, that wasn't really what we were up to, you know. I mean, we kind of started. We started with on off which we found we were quite good at, and we just kept developing from there. We liked things being tight and clean, and, uh, r you know, when we had ideas, the thing you have to do is you have to, you know, gain those skills in order to realize them in a erudite fashion. <laughs> you uh, famously made three now incredibly influential records. Um, and a very controversial live record sort of at the tail end of that run. And then you went away. Um, was it, and that seemed part of the band's way of operating throughout its history. We've got something to say, we say it, and then we, we don't force the issue, we go away. None of it's <laughs> deliberate. <clears throat> I mean, you know, I'm, we've been credited with way more than we've actually done, I think. Uh, I, I, there was, you know, circumstance, yeah. you know, caused the, the fan, yeah, yeah, caused the bus to drive off the cliff yeah. um, in, in early 1980. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'm, anyone who's who's read uh, Wilson Neat's book on the BAM will know that that's, uh, that was quite a difficult period for everybody. Yeah. And then you're reincarnated uh, a few years later. There's and no I remember this, people actively you know, people that I knew at the time who were big fans of the first three records were absolutely appalled. Yes, they were. When, when you came back and, and there was that, you know, keyboards, what, what you know, it was just, it was just shocking to some, some people, which it's I imagine was... rock. That's exactly. It wasn't <laughs> rock, man. Exactly. It and wasn't much of a keyboard. It was like a $69 Casio Radio Shack. Yeah. No, it fucking wasn't. It was an SK-1. It's one of the, yeah, it was this big. It was this big. It was, it was one of the finest instruments ever made. I've had six. It had that barking dog key. Remember that? Yeah, you know, we arr, loved it. Yeah, it was good for sound check. You loved that. I loved it. I still do. But I've heard there's a new machine, which I'm going to replace it with. But we did find a solution for that, as, as Greg was saying about people hating us. Uh, it was before we were going to do this tour in, I think it was like 80, 87, uh, Brian Grant, who was our manager, and we said, what we're going to do is we're not going to play anything old. And Brian just went, no. He said, God, you fuckers, what are you going to do that for? He said, right. He said, if you're going to do that, he said, I want volunteers and you're going to go to New York and you're going to do seven days of interviews and phoners. And Colin and I went. It was two, yeah. Was it two? It was, it was two, like two yeah. days. Yeah. It's a lot better with seven. Anyway. And Colin story, and I went. stories get bigger. And we were, anyway, we were blithering idiots by the end of it because you we were talking to like 40 people a day. It was incredible. But at the end of that... Uh, we had an in-person person interview, which was him, right? Before we'd gone, Bruce and I were having a conversation with a guy, and he was saying, what are you doing? We said, this, this, this. And we said, ideally, what we would like is to have a band, a cover band that would play like all of the records, and we could send them out so people would be happy, right? And we could get on with what we're doing. So anyway, at the end of this interview, Jim says, Oh, I've got a group. And I thought, oh, fabulous. You know what I mean? Here we go again. And he says, we play Pink Flag. I said, what? All of it? And he said, yeah. I said, what, with the gaps? He said, yeah, with the gaps. I said, what do you do when the first side finishes? He said, oh, the bass player says, side two. 
So um, we went, wow, can you do the New York show? Because you were living in Hoboken, yeah? And we said, we were going to do, we were going to do Maxwell's to warm up and then we are going to do the Ritz, Ritz, right? So that was that, and we were like, wow, you know, we've got something anyway. You know, something's fallen our way in a kind of Duchampian way. Anyway, what happened was, I don't know, about a couple of weeks later, Brian said, you know those guys you were talking about? He said, they're going to do the whole tour. He said, they've never seen America, and they're going to get in a van, take their vacations, and do all of it. And that was our solution. It didn't really help things too much because people said the best thing someone said to me in LA was, you know, the opening band, their material's better than wires. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they got reviewed in the NME, wasn't it? It, it? The NME sent somebody from London to review that show, and you guys had gone up to Vancouver, and we couldn't, the van wasn't going to make it that yeah, far. Yeah, you couldn't do that one. So we went to LA a day or two before you got there, and we went to the thrift shops and bought some what I've always called pretentious English art punk clothing that was like the sort of thing you were wearing. You had this... Of course. You had this shiny running suit that you wore and Colin had red braces, right? So we dressed like Wire, came out dressed like Wire, played Wire's music, and then Wire came out dressed like Wire, and the enemy proclaimed that Wire so admired the ex-Lion Tamers, they dressed like the ex-Lion Tamers. It was absolutely brilliant. Well, as Bruce said, you're touring behind an, an album called The Ideal Copy, and Bruce would always say, any form of disinformation is useful. Yeah, it was the ideal copy. And this is absolutely true. The, the first, uh, let me think, after, was it after New York? Uh, we played in Philly, I think, the first night. It was the first night, and we were standing watching them play, and they played Strange, you know, which goes... There's something strange going on tonight. There's something going on that's not quite right. <laughs> Bruce started going, oh, yes. Because that's Philly's where Duchamp's collection is. You know, it was like... Well, yeah. thank you. Thank you for telling that story that way, Graham. Jim DeRogatis, uh, the drummer in the ex-Lion Tamers. Uh, I was sort of a cross between Robert. And Robert, of course, how tall are you, Robert? 6'3". Uh, 6'3". Six, three. Six, three. I've always thought that if they compacted you vertically, you might wind up as wide as I am horizontally. <laughs> but I... Actually, what we could do... It was do a tribute. We could was my doppelganger. Or we could try and stretch you. <laughs> that might be more painful. Yeah, that's... It's been done. But, I, but I, I sang the amelodic Graham parts, and I played the Robert drums. So, you know, I would say, no, 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 Mr. Suit! So I was a cross between the two of you. But... Well, I, would, I would like to... Before we leave L.A. in 87, you alluded to this earlier, uh, probably the biggest single television appearance that the band has ever done, The Tonight Show. How many of you have seen the YouTube video that I'm referring to? The Tonight Show, to, for those who haven't, Suzanne Summers was filling in as the guest host that night on The Tonight Show. Instead and her, of it was shooting she, instead of Joan Rivers. She's never fully recovered, I don't think, from that that particular. So you guys got this national forum for the first time in this country, a truly national forum, one of the most watched television shows in, in America. Back when the three networks were like what there was, yeah. And, and you come out and play, play drill um, <laughs> and just abuse the audience, the television audience. That's a lie. And I mean no, that no, in a love no, it's not it's entirely a complete true. fabrication. They, they, didn't, uh, they didn't really uh, give us many options actually. It was originally going to be like, right, you have to, we do two songs, so we were going to do like the latest single. Ahead. And then, and then we, were going to do, we were going to do Drill as a second song, and then they cut us down to one song. And they, they, they were like, it was all very um, uncomfortable, and it, it was, they weren't very band friendly. Well, the reason, I mean, the reason you know, we got cut down, though, was we got cut down because, we, you know, you do this sort of like camera run-through rehearsal, and we did Ahead, and they'd asked us to edit it as well. And we went, yeah, okay, we could do that. And we edited something out. Um, and we played ahead and the cameraman ran around and all of that stuff. And they went, oh, uh, upstairs, they're saying, it's great, you know, will you do it again? And we did it again. They went, it's perfect, guys. You know? And then we played drill. 
and they were like, wow, you know, oh, upstairs is really happy about this too, you know. And they said, uh, will you play it again for us? And so we played it again. And then there was, all, everything kind of went weird and people started talking to each other and they were going, um, someone upstairs says, um, it was different <laughs> that time. And we said, yeah, it's different every time. And that's when they, a little bit later, they said, oh, you've only got one song now. So they expected us to play the single, and we went, oh, we're going to play Drill. <laughs> and that, and it was downhill all the way after that. Well, Suzanne Summers' quote, I just got to read this. I was, trying to sing, I was trying to sing along, but I couldn't catch the words. You're sort of a far-out group. That was her two-sentence <laughs> critique. Well, the thing oh, about it was well, we didn't, know who, she, that, we didn't know who she was because she yeah. didn't bother to come and introduce herself. So when this woman in, in rather punky leather clothes came over, it was like, okay, who are you, you know? She'd gone and said hello to Mel Brooks. No, but she, you guys also had that video camera that you were shoving oh, yeah. in her face. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, filming she did, her as she was trying to interview you on the biggest television show in America. Yeah, it was just, it was, a weird, it was a weird, it was a, it was like a weird whole kind of like freak show basically. It was great. Our sound man came he said they're going to fuck you up. And we were going how are they going to do that? He said they're putting delays on weird delays on everything. And we went oh you can't you can't mess drill up. So they just like added to it and because of all the confusion about us when we did it the second time um, what had happened was that we left everything on maximum and we'd all forgotten about that. So when we came on to play it, it had all these delays and it was on max. So we started on 10 and just like continued. <laughs> yeah. I'll never forget the look on your publicist's face. Poor Peter. Oh, he, Peter. he looked like he was going to die. Yeah, I know. But he's managing the swans now. So he's done all right. <laughs> for punishment. Uh, so, so it was nice of you guys to indulge my, uh, you know, that story. Uh, I promised Jason, our producer, I would not be a fanboy. And I have to say, um, you know, uh, despite my fondness for you as four human beings, um, you know, what Wire has meant to me as a critic is consistently challenging me, starting with that notion of nostalgia being the kiss of death. If you look it up in the dictionary, nostalgia was coined during the Napoleonic Wars as a disease for soldiers who were taken so far from their homes that it was a physical ailment, right? It was a sickness. And you have fought that now for almost 40 years, consistently saying, we make art that is about now, this moment, you know, and as a daily newspaper critic having to see the Rolling Stones play Jumping Jack Flash for the 790th time, you know, this month, you know, I, I, it was so anathema to everything I loved about rock and roll. How the heck have you held on to that be here now aesthetic for so long? It's just in the DNA of the band. I don't, I mean, to be quite honest, we can't do it any other way. There would be, if, if we were to like try and sort of embrace a nostalgia circuit, I think there would just be, uh, the band would just wander off. Yeah. Uh, just uh, AWL, it's, it's, it's just not, it's not interesting enough. And that, I mean, it's a, it's a hard uphill struggle, you know, we'll play, you, know, you still get people who come to shows who think that, you know, because they paid their however many dollars they have for the show, they're entitled to have, it's like a restaurant, you know, I want to have this, this and this and this because I paid my dollars for the show, but you especially get that attitude in America. And, you know, meeting, meeting a sort of this British quite determined sort of attitude of, no, we're going to do what we want to do because that's the thing we can do best. We we aren't entertainment. That's the th that's the that's the main point about why it's not it's not an entertainment. It's it's it doesn't come from that stand standpoint. It doesn't mean so. There's no entertainment in it. It can be entertaining, but we don't we don't start from the point of view of entertainment. And an entertainer is someone who will try and please the audience in every circumstance, <coughs> and it's, it's that is that is made happy by that. And our, our our viewpoint is we want to give you the best thing we can give you. Which is the newest thing? Which we've is the got. newest thing, or the thing that we're excited about playing, yeah. and the thing that we, the, the thing that we want to say, and, <coughs> and uh, you know, luckily, we've kept an audience of that of people who say, yeah, 
Okay, yeah, no, that's, that's really good. We, I, I've experienced, I mean, we've had on this tour so many people coming and saying, this is the best time we've ever seen you. And, and we're playing, you know, you could, you, could, you could call it a challenging set. It's not challenging. It's actually highly accessible music. It just ha doesn't happen to be, you know, records, you know, re reproduction of records that were made in, in the 70s. You know, that's, yeah. And, and, and really, honestly, it's, it's, you know, it's about being kind of true to yourself and being kind of real about this. You know, he says in a very unreal situation. <laughs> No, but you, you would say that to me if we were arguing backstage about how bad Manscaped was. Yeah, yeah, but Manscaped was rubbish. You know what it, yeah, right. Well, you didn't say it at the time. You didn't talk to me for like five years. Yeah, no, no, no Manscaped actually could really seriously do with being remixed. There's a great album in there. I bet there is. Well, you proved that with the last record where you went back to uh, document an eyewitness. I mean, it's a fascinating way to deal with your own past. Well, that's, that's yet again, it's like we're not one of those things that, you know, it, was, it wasn't planned, but it's been around, all that material has been around for a long, long time. And the thing about it, all of it, that stuff, there's like one record was very much the songs which, you know, would have, would have f formed the backbone to what would have been the fourth record, which didn't get made. And the other side, which was more of a... Uh, kind of like a, a, a provocation, I guess. We wrote the material the week before, rehearsed it, and then played it, you know? And, and in that way, a lot of the things were just sketches. And there were sketches which went on, I don't know, they were attached to strange performance things, you know? Um, and so they'd never been edited or really hammered into shape the way we usually do. So we dipped into that stuff which didn't become a record over the years, like underwater experiences, things like that. You know, they've come and gone and we've transformed other things. You're but, also the, go ahead. Huh? Um, I can't remember what I was gonna say now. Well, I'm sorry, Graham, to interrupt. I. Uh, what I what I'm seeing in the band is not only recontextualizing material from the past, but you are on a streak now of of new material. Uh, this is an amazingly prolific period for the group. I mean, given your history, um, and we say this because I think a lot of bands, when they've been as as Jim mentioned earlier, you know, 39, 38 years as a band, start treading water, start looking back, recycling. You guys are actually creating more new stuff now, you know, at, at as high a rate as, as, as ever, it seems like. With this new record, we should talk about it, self-titled, um, 1920 songs, you could, have, you could have made two records out of mm. that. What accounts for this uh, tremendous outpouring of new well, material? Well, he helps. Matthew. He helps a lot. We tried to give him the spotlight. You notice how self-effacing he was? <laughs> he doesn't need a spotlight, man. He's, he's got the hair. <laughs> yeah, he's the only one with the hair. Well, that's what someone said the other night, anyway. I mean, uh, actually, somebody said, I can't remember which gig it was. I mean, they all became a blur after a while on this tour. But the, the guy came up, the guy came after, uh, afterwards, and they said, the thing about you guys is that, you know, I, I see other bands of, of your vintage going around. He didn't say it quite so. He was quite drunk, so he didn't say it quite in this way. But other bands of your vintage going around. And basically what they do is they play the new songs from the new album, but they sound just like the old songs from the old albums. And then they play all the old songs from the old albums and everybody cheers and they go home. Like, it's like, Result. You, know, you guys, we always get called you guys in America, do, you know, do something different, you yeah. know. And, um, that was Susan Summers' fatal mistake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like, it, it's a weird expression because it's, it, it's kind of like you're a job lot. You know, we're like, just like the dudes. <laughs> like we were, well, just in, we were just in Louisville and they had this shop called the Furniture Dudes. We saw some of them out the back, actually. They didn't have shirts on, so I guess that's what made them dudes. Yeah. 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 Man, they were really inked up. You're listening to Sound Opinions. I'm Greg Cobb with Jim DeRigatis. We're here in the Goose Island Barrel House with, uh, with Wire, and we would like to thank Colin, Graham, uh, Robert, and Matthew for being our guests today, guys. Thanks so much for coming in. It's, it's always fun with you guys. 
We could do this for three more hours. We could do this, this for three. Off, right? We could do it for three weeks, I guess. Yeah. I didn't get Robert to talk enough. Mm -hmm. I'm so Dang. bummed. But we have to get some music because these guys have to. These guys have to play a gig yet again. So they, you know.